It's December 2015, and this is Wow Signal Burst 10. Nick Nielsen with the Wilderness Hypothesis. Hello, this is Nick Nielsen. Today I will be talking about what I call the Wilderness Hypothesis. There is a well-known paper by John A. Ball published in Icarus in 1973 titled The Zoo Hypothesis, which developed the now familiar idea that the answer to the Fermi paradox is that Earth is being treated as a zoo by a far more advanced extraterrestrial intelligence. Ball wrote, quote, The only way we can understand the apparent non-interaction between them and us is to hypothesize that they are deliberately avoiding interaction and that they have set aside the area in which we live as a zoo. The zoo hypothesis predicts that we shall never find them because they do not want to be found, and they have the technological ability to ensure this. Of Ball's zoo hypothesis, Stephen Webb wrote in his book, If the universe is teeming with aliens, where is everybody? 50 Solutions to the Fermi Paradox and the Problem of Extraterrestrial Life. Quote, The advanced extraterrestrial civilizations will, in some sense, be in control of the universe. The less advanced will be destroyed, tamed, or assimilated. The important question becomes, how will highly developed extraterrestrial civilizations choose to exert their power? Arguing in analogy with how mankind exerts its power over the natural world, wherein we set aside wilderness areas, wildlife sanctuaries, and zoos so that other species can develop naturally, Ball speculated that Earth is a wilderness area set aside for us by extraterrestrial civilizations, unquote. Webb also distinguished ideas related to the zoo hypothesis, such as the leaky embargo scenario due to James Deerdorf and the interdict scenario due to Martin Fogg, in which latter scenario, quote, advanced extraterrestrial civilizations would have a reason to leave a life-bearing planet well alone, if only because the planet will provide a non-renewable source of information, unquote. Hence, Earth and its life has been placed under an, an interdict. It would not require much effort to further produce additional scenarios on the theme of the zoo scenario, but I would like to return to Ball's original 1973 paper to focus on a particular variant that I will call the wilderness hypothesis. In his paper, Ball wrote, quote, Technological progress may be defined as increasing ability to control one's environment. Already at our level of technology, we affect almost everything on Earth from elephants to viruses. But we do not always exert the power we possess. Occasionally, we set aside wilderness areas, wildlife sanctuaries, or zoos in which other species or other civilizations are allowed to develop naturally, that is, interacting very little with man. The perfect zoo, or perfect wilderness area, or sanctuary, would be one in which the fauna inside do not interact with or are unaware of their zookeepers, unquote. For Ball... The difference between a zoo and a wilderness sanctuary seems to be that a zoo is an imperfect sanctuary, while a perfect sanctuary would allow for events within the wilderness to develop without any interaction at all with forces not attributable to the local ecosystem. Thus, for Ball, the difference between a zoo and a wilderness is the difference in the degree of the isolation and autonomy of the species subject to management in this way. As a direct extrapolation of Ball's zoo hypothesis, then, the wilderness hypothesis would be the strongest form of the zoo hypothesis, in which the species or biosphere subject to management by an external power would enjoy a nearly perfect isolation from the agents of such wilderness management. In such a wilderness, we would not expect to see the collaring or tracking of species for scientific purposes, as such interaction would violate the pristine character of the wilderness. The wilderness hypothesis can, however, be interpreted much more radically so that it is sufficiently distinct from the zoo hypothesis that it can and should be treated separately. Allow me to expand upon this. A universe in which a civilization produced by some intelligent species can be treated as though contained in a zoo implies a universe in which intelligent species are densely represented. This would constitute the cosmological equivalent of what I have called an intelligence-rich biosphere. An intelligence-rich biosphere, as I have explored the idea, is a biosphere that gives rise to multiple intelligent species. 
From a terrestrial point of view, this is a counterfactual, as the terrestrial biosphere has only a single intelligent species. At least, it has had only a single intelligent species since the hominid tree has been trimmed down to a single representative species, Homo sapiens. The cosmological equivalent of an intelligence-rich biosphere would be an intelligence-rich galactic habitable zone. In an intelligence-rich galactic habitable zone, multiple planetary systems possessing multiple biospheres that incubate multiple intelligent species with the result of a galaxy rich in intelligent life. But for universes in which civilizations can be treated as though contained in a zoo, an additional assumption is required, such that one or more of the multiple intelligent species of the intelligence-rich galactic habitable zone would be so far in advance of the other intelligences that less advanced planetary systems and their biota could be carefully managed and monitored. I find this inherently implausible, as an intelligence-rich galactic habitable zone would also mean a high level of diversity of intelligence, and under these conditions it would be nearly impossible to enforce radio silence or non-intervention in an embargoed world, hence the rationale for the leaky embargo scenario mentioned above. A true wilderness neither implies nor assumes such density of intelligence in the cosmos, nor any regime of management or monitoring. Moreover, we can distinguish between a wilderness defined as a de jure reserve and a wilderness defined de facto by the territorial range of an apex predator. An apex predator enforces a no-go zone within its, within its territory, perhaps marked by some distinctive spore or odor. We have lost the sense of being in competition with other predators with whom we share an extended range divided up into territory since we have established dominion over our entire world by settle, settling the planet. On our, on our home world today, we essentially dictate the conditions on which other species are allowed to continue to exist. These terms often include the kind of wildlife sanctuaries noted by Ball. Before we made ourselves the apex pr predator of the planet entire, however, prior to the globalization of civilization, there were other predators with which we were previously in competition. The settlement of Earth and the globalization of civilization I call extensive totality, here practiced on a planetary scale. An intelligent species that was able to enforce an embargo or a sanctuary would have, have had to have achieved extensive totality on an interstellar scale. But there are wildernesses where, there, where no single apex predator can dictate the existential conditions to other predators suffered to exist. Such may be the situation of an apex extraterrestrial intelligence or several apex extraterrestrial intelligences in our universe, being powerful but not omnipotent, able to enforce a no-go zone within their territory but not able to di dictate the conditions of life outside their territory. The universe may well be divided up among several apex extraterrestrial intelligences and their territories. A wilderness divided territorially by local apex predators is very different from the kind of wilderness that exists as the result of setting aside a wildlife sanctuary. And if the universe is too large or too complex to be dominated by a single apex ETI, or several such, a cosmological wilderness obtains in which territories are marked out by conventions by which local apex ETIs are recognized and acknowledged, but there may also be extensive regions in which no apex intelligence can enforce its writ. In fact, a scenario like this was described in a comment on my Centauri Dreams post, Cosmic Loneliness and Interstellar Travel, by a reader identified as Tarman. Quote, There had been a lot of water under the bridge before we came along. Many times in our past we thought that everything revolved around us. I believe it likely that this wilderness has long since been divvied up into territories by the biggest, baddest old bears. They're out there, but with the nose only for their rivals over their food, their energy sources. These old bears are probably AI machine networks. I know it's depressing, and most people don't want the Earth to revolve around the sun or humans to evolve from apes, but there it is. We can still carve out a niche, unquote. This is the sense in which I think we need to take the wilderness hypothesis into account. The universe may be a large and lonely wilderness, but not empty. We may be within the territory of some apex extraterrestrial intelligence that rarely bothers to roam in our direction, or we may simply be in a wilderness that is so vast that our stretch of territory has not yet been claimed. Either way, as Tarman pointed out, 
we can still carve ourselves out a niche, though we may have to hold our breath and play dead when the biggest, baddest old bears in the cosmos wander too closely for comfort. Indeed, playing dead may be a viable strategy for survival in this wilderness of the cosmos primeval, in which we have no idea what to expect from the trackless depths of the universe. We may need to go so far as to fake our own extinction. In my previous wow signal burst, I mentioned the paper Observational Signatures of Self-Destructive Civilizations by Adam Stevens, Duncan Foreman, Forgan, and Jack O'Malley James, which provides us with something like a catalog of observational signatures that might be faked in order to give a false appearance of our extinction. We might generate an enormous electromagnetic pulse, followed by strictly enforced radio silence, which would look like we had destroyed ourselves in a massive nuclear exchange. Such a ruse would, of course, only satisfy a certain technological level of proficiency in the searching for observational signatures by some other civilization, but it could not ultimately mask the thermodynamic signatures of industrial civilization. Thus, the most radical form of playing dead as a civilization would be to entirely give up industrial civilization, thus also the thermodynamic signatures of a high-energy civilization, and revert to hunter-gatherer nomadism, which would preserve the species for as long as the planet remains habitable, and would thus avoid attracting the attention of pro potentially problematic alien civilizations, but would not assure our own ex existential viability in the long term. Much better would be to allow the development of civilization until it were possible to settle many worlds, camouflaging our activity up to that time, and only then, after we, improved, after we have improved the existential viability of our species by several orders of magnitude, dispensing with technology and going dark as a civilization, as a long-term survival strategy. Thank you. This has been Nick Nielsen for WOW Signal Bursts. In addition to WOW Signal Bursts, I am an occasional contributor to Centauri Dreams and to the Unseen Podcast, and I blog regularly at geopolycraticus.wordpress.com and geopolycraticus.tumblr.com. <laughs>been wow signal burst 10 nick nielsen with the wilderness hypothesis for more information please visit wowsignalpodcast.com music by jason robinson the wow signal podcast is distributed under the creative commons attribution share alike license